So that's a view of the conservatory. It's um, seven and a half metres end to end, uh, two and a half metres wide, two and three quarter metres at the ridge. Um, there's an opening door and two opening windows at each end. There's a door into the house as well, but you can't see that. Um, it, uh, the projects provided automatic climate and irrigation control uh, for the conservatory and uh, automatic irrigation of the outside garden as well. A couple of planting beds run down each side and I've already got the automatic heating, cooling, humidification and irrigation up and running. But there's a bit more to do yet. So there's a, there's a pond runs down the centre. And that's, um, that's five metres long, uh, three quarters of a metre deep and just over a metre wide. Uh, and there's a utility pit about a cubic metre at each end, where there's various electronics and stuff. Um, so the purpose of the pond is to store rainwater for irrigation and humidification. It holds just over four cubic metres of water. And as you can see, there's a, the galvanised steel grating over it that provides a walkway. I've used the Arduino Mega 2560 as the controller. Uh, I was going to use the Uno, but I didn't think it was quite, did quite enough inputs and outputs for me. And the user interface is a PC, Windows PC, uh, which provides monitoring, set point adjustment and calibration and, and data logging. Uh, but the Arduino looks after the, the control, day-to-day -day control. Uh, Windows code's written in Visual Basic using the .NET framework and Microsoft Visual Studio 2013. And communication from the Arduino and the conservatory to the PC in the house is by a 15-meter USB lead with a active booster. Um, it's working well, but I have had a few issues with it. I, if anybody's into communicating with Arduino and USB, I'd love to talk to you later on, tomorrow, maybe, because I've got a few questions there. Uh, the cooling and ventilation is provided by opening and closing the windows, four of the, the four windows. Each window is fitted with a pneumatic cylinder to control its position. And I've got uh, compressed air at 100 psi being provided by a small compressor and receiver regulator and regulator. Just a standard little kind of paint spraying compressor. Um, there are four 12-volt DC pneumatic valves and two manifolds that route the compressed air to and from the four cylinders. These are the water solenoid valves. Again, they're 12-volt DC and uh, used for irrigation. There's eight of them, reading from left to right, the eight outlet solenoid valves, uh, a manifold made up of, of brass T's and two inlet valves to the right, which provide the uh, supply of rainwater uh, via a pump, which is in series with the valve, or, or mains water, if there's a shortage of rainwater. I've got samples of the cylinders in the valves and things. If anybody wants to look at those afterwards, there's a cylinder there, there's a water valve and a pneumatic valve. Now the software imposes two uh, interlocking rules on those, those water valves. 
Rule one ensures that only one of the eight outlet valves is ever energised at any time. And rule two ensures that only one of the two inlet valves are ever energised at one time. Um, rule one ensures that uh, I don't overload the, the water supply sources. So I've always got good pressure for irrigating the beds. Um, rule two prevents any risk of backfeeding from the, the rainwater supply to the mains water supply. And the rules together prevent the DC power supply that feeds them being overloaded. And secondly, the flow sensor, which is there between those two valves and the rest of the valves, you can't really see it very well on here. Uh, but there's also a flow sensor over there if you want to look at it later. And, and by positioning it where it is, the software always knows uh, where, when it's receiving a signal from the flow sensor, it knows where the water's coming from and where it's going to, so it can be properly allocated to the correct outlet and, uh, and source. Now, yeah, uh, configuration for irrigation. Um, there's an irrigation cycle that takes place once a day. Uh, and you can configure the start time of that. Uh, I have it set for late evening. Um, you can configure the sequence in which the, uh, the beds are irrigated. You can configure the soil moisture level of the bed as to whether irrigation will occur for that particular bed or not. You can configure the volume of water delivered and you can, for any particular bed that is, and you can also configure the, uh, the time for which the water will be delivered, which is really a backup to the volume. Because if the flow sensor fails, you don't want to be delivering water forevermore. So that time setting pretty well matches the, the, the volume delivered anyway. So I needed 16 relay outputs, well, 15 actually, I think. And I found this relay board on the internet. Um, there's loads to choose from, as I'm sure you know. Um, I chose this one, and it wasn't until I realised the significance of something, which is that um, the relays are energised by grounding the input pins. And uh, so they did, uh, the Arduino could use a digital right low to send its GPIO pin low to sync the relay board inputs. But that poses a rather horrible and serious problem in as much as if the power is lost to an Arduino, all its outputs go low. Uh, and that would mean that every relay would energise, every solenoid was energised, and it would be a pretty disastrous and unacceptable failure. I thought about various solutions, but in the end, I decided to, uh, to put them... Um, a small interface board to connect the Arduino to the relay board and incorporate some Darlington inverters, uh, two eight uh, uh, element chips, uh, so that uh, now we can pull, uh, use the Arduino GPI output to go high to activate the relays and everything fails nice and safely. Now a bit about sensors. So there's a temperature sensor for the uh, controlling the heating and the, uh, the window positioning. There is a humidity sensor for controlling the humidification system. There's the water flow sensor which I've already mentioned. Uh, the soil moisture sensors, I've got two at the moment, but I may add more later for, for, for the rest of the beds. 
and there's a level sensor for the rainwater pond which decides where the water will be drawn from and like I say I may be adding some more later. Now <coughs> I did a bit of internet research to decide what I was going to use as a temperature sensor. Uh, there was plenty, plenty to look at um, and in fact there's a, a very inexpensive digital device called a DHT11 which does both humidity and temperature but I wasn't overly impressed with its accuracy. Um, so I procured various devices and tested them and that led me to a, a bit of a kind of policy decision that it would be, well it would be an analogue device, not a digital. It would be a linear device that produces a voltage proportional to temperature, not a device such as a thermistor. And I found the LM35DZ, which I'm very pleased with. The, uh, don't know how well you can see that. It produces one, it produces one volt at 100 degrees C. It produces no volts at zero degrees C. And I've just followed it with a, a little in, non-inverting op amp to give me about uh, not to three volts output. And this sort of looking at temperature sensors overlapped into looking at humidity sensors as well. And I came to a more general decision, which has worked very well for me. I decided that all the sensors, with the exception of flow, which I'll come back to in a minute, will produce an analog voltage in the range of 0 to 4 volts, directly proportional to the value being measured. So I was trying to have a kind of standardized approach to how I did things. Um, and where additional signal conditioning is required, analog signal conditioning, such as the op amp I've just mentioned, then that would be provided at the sensor in a small potting box, the sensor head. So I end up with using a three core screen cable. Uh, one core provides the plus five volts for the sensor, naught volts, the signal to lay Arduino analog input and the screen is connected to naught volts at, at, the analog, at the Arduino end only. And the PC software uses uh, configurable variables for offset and scale. These are used in a calibration calculation to convert the raw values of naught to 1023 approximately from the analog inputs to the values seen by the user, such as temperature in degrees C and humidity in percent. Uh, that's the humidity sensor I found. It's not the cheapest, but it's still cheap enough. It's only a couple of quid or so, I think. Um, very accurate, very nice device. Produces, uh, that was me a minute. What does it give me here? 0.8 volts to 4 volts over the humidity, full humidity range. Um, so I didn't even need any additional signal, analog signal conditioning circuit, circuitry for that. Now the flow sensor, again, it was less than a fiver. Very nice little device. Unlike the analog sensors, it uh, produces a stream of pulses at a frequency proportional to flow. Um, its output is connected to an Arduino digital input uh, with a three core screen cable, same spec as the analog uh, sensors. And the Arduino software uses an interrupt routine to count the number of pulses received per second. This count is then scaled to provide a volume reading in litres and a flow reading in litres per second. 
Soil moisture and water level sensors, I'm going to come back to at the end. That's the power supply I've used, um, which is very handy. Um, CCTV power supply. Four 12 volt DC outputs, which were very conveniently used for one for the pneumatics, one for the water solenoids, one for the Arduino board and one for the relay board. Uh, I'm going to mess a lot of this out. I'd love to talk to you about my DIY EMC testing, but I'll do that tomorrow if anybody's interested. <laughs> um, this is the main board, which is in one of the utility pits. So if you, yeah, if you look across the top, I don't know how well you can see that. It's a row of terminal uh, four-way terminal blocks across the top, which connect to the various sensors by the screen leads. There's a 100K resistor and a 0.1 microfarad cap on each of the analog lines to, to help filter out any noise, in addition to the digital filtering that's, that's used in the software. Uh, there's the power supply. There's the Arduino. There's the interface board with the inverters. There's the relay board and the four pneumatic valves and the two pneumatic manifolds are at the bottom. Um, just a bit about window control. It's a proportional closed loop system. Uh, it has a target or set point for the temperature, which is subtracted from the, the actual temperature to give an error signal. Error signals then used to move the windows in such a direction as to reduce the error. Uh, the amount by which the windows move relative to the error is determined by a configurable gain setting. And uh, if we can get that right, the windows should stabilise in a nice uh, intermediate position with the temperature error at zero. Now then, let's have a look. I'm going to have to miss this. I was going to talk a lot more about window control, but I've no time. But I'm just going to say how I've done it in software. So I've used a state machine which is kind of like using methods or, or subroutines and, or functions in that it keeps the, uh, the software uh, operations where you would expect to find them. Uh, it's easier to kind of follow and understand as you're dabbling with it and kind of making it better. And the likelihood of changes to software in any particular state are are very unlikely to cause unexpected results elsewhere. Um, I've taken a lot of information off this drawing because the blue lines are transitions from one state to another, the total of seven states. Um, I've moved a lot, taken a lot of those blue lines out because I just wanted to talk about uh, a little bit of it that concerns the gain and what I've called the dwell time. Um, so if you think, the, think about there's a temperature error, so we want to open the windows. Um, so we produce a pulse of compressed air to the cylinders to open the windows by a little increment. Uh, and when that's happening, we're in that opening pulse state. And the duration of that pulse is the product of the temperature error and the gain setting. So either of those being higher will produce a bigger pulse and make the system more lively. It then goes to the dwell state, um, which uh, again is, is just a time delay, really. Uh, and again, the value of the dwell is configurable in the software. And it needs to match roughly Obviously, the room, the building's got a time constant. As you move the windows, you don't see the result of that movement. 
straight away at the sensor. Uh, it looks as though it's around about 80 seconds in my case. So that dwell time really wants to be somewhere close to that. Otherwise, it's not going to respond as you would expect. The other information that I've left off this is what actually goes on in all the states, um, which again, we can if anybody wants to come and talk about that tomorrow, that's great. Now, uh, the configurable settings I'm using at present for gain and dwell are very rough estimates. I just haven't had time. I've really only just finished. Well, I haven't finished it yet. And I just haven't had time to fine tune it and get it right yet. But to just give you an idea, oops, what was that? Yeah. That's the first plot I ever took and saw what was happening. And it was pretty horrible. Um, the orange line is the set point, the blue line is the temperature, and the gray line is the window position. And you can see that the windows are cycling between fully closed and fully open at about an hourly rate. That data represents about four hours. So the dwell was uh, too short and the gain was too long there. So then I took a rough guess, sort of intuitively, what I thought those values should be and got that result which is a lot better because the windows are now remaining in an intermediate position, um, but it's still cycling, as you can see. Again, at about an hourly rate. Uh, it's about an hour and a half's data there. So I'm looking forward to playing around with that this autumn and getting it completely stable. Uh, now, I'm coming to the last part of the talk now. Yeah. concerns soil moisture sensing and water liquid level sensing. The internet and eBay are awash with cheap soil moisture sensors. Most of them appear to measure the soil resistance and this in my opinion renders them unsuitable for any serious project. Uh, by electrolysis, the electrode soon corrode and the sensor fails. In addition, soil resistance is only roughly representative of moisture. Uh, it's also affected by pH and chemical content, fertilizer, etc. And you can get a polar polarizing effect as well from the electrolysis, which kind of puts little air bubbles around the electrodes and they go all over the place. All this stuff has been long known and good quality sensors measure the electrical capacitance between the electrode and the medium being measured. Uh, this approach eliminates all the shortcomings I've just mentioned and it makes the sensor equally suitable for measuring either soil moisture content or liquid level. The liquid being, level being measured can be conductive, such as water. It can be non-conductive, such as oil. And it can even be powder or grain in a hopper. Uh, the bad news is that such capacitance sense probes seem to be expensive. I couldn't find a, an inexpensive one. And therefore, I decided to make my own. So it comprises two electrodes. Those are the yellow things there, which protrude into the soil or the water. The electrodes connect directly to the sensor head containing the necessary signal conditioning hardware. It operates on 5 volts DC and produces a linear DC output within the range 0 to 3.8 volts, proportional to soil moisture or liquid level. Uh, there's a working unit in that corner there. Uh, it's been running since lunchtime. And uh, just to show you my confidence, there's no overflow in th from the glass jar at the top. Uh, it's reliant on getting switched off when the level reaches the right level. 
I was even going to position it over my keyboard and my oscilloscope, but I thought that was maybe being a bit too daring. <laughs> so I make the electrodes out of aluminium strip, and for a conductive medium, such as soil or water, they need to be covered with a thin layer of good quality insulation. Um, I tested the insulation by placing the two electrodes in a jar of water and putting a mega or a flash tester across them. And I was very surprised how difficult it was to get a good insulation. I tried motor winding varnish, which I thought would be good, PCB varnish, one or two aer aerosol sprays of paint, some stuff called liquid tape, and some stuff called G4, which is really for putting on concrete for waterproofing ponds. All those products failed the insulation test. The final solution was to have the electrodes powder painted. The workpiece is charged with static electricity, sprayed with polyester powder, and then baked for 20 minutes in an oven. I think anodising would be good as well, but I haven't tried that. Now I exper experimented with a variety of circuits and I was hoping to talk more about that but again I haven't time. So I ended up with a 556 timer, two 555s in one packet, packet. The first timer is connected as an A-stable oscillator and produces a stream of triggering pulses across there to the trigger input of the second timer which is connected as a one-shot multivibrator and the pulse duration that comes out of that is determined by the capacitance value of the probe down here. Um, so it looks a bit like that. So all you have to do then is um, just filter the output with an RC filter and I've buffered it with an op amp to give me a nice steady DC output. There's the triggering pulses and there's the output pulses which grow longer as the level rises and you can look at that on the scope over there if you want later. And that came into flower just the other day. It's 10 inches high and 7 inches wide. <laughs> so I'm rather chuffed with that. Uh, I think we're done. Um, thanks for letting me share this project with you. Um, I've missed out a lot, as I say, because of time li limitation. I was going to talk about different circuit approaches for the capacitance probe. I haven't even mentioned the, uh, the uh, PC Windows software for configuring and monitoring, but we'll have a look at that tomorrow. I shall be around all tomorrow if anybody's interested. Um, I was rather chuffed with my EMC DIY testing as well, which I'd love to tell you about. Um, and also a bit more about window stability and control. Yeah, I think that's about it. Thank you very much.